So today's sermon is entitled, From Small Seed to Mighty Shelter. And I've always been personally fascinated by the parables of Jesus. And lately, I've been spending some extra time in study and meditation on his words and illustrations. And so this morning, I'd like, or this afternoon, I'd like to share some of what the Spirit has revealed to me. I'd like to share it with you in the hopes that you would be as blessed and encouraged as I have been, as I've been studying through this particular parable. And so today, I'm going to invite you on a journey to look into Jesus's parable of the mustard seed, the mustard seed. This parable is written out in the Gospels according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So let's just start right there. Start in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Then in Mark's account, and he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up, and becomes larger than all the garden plants, and puts out large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. And then finally, Luke's gospel. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden. And it grew and became a tree. And the birds of the air made nests, in its branches. And Jesus often publicly spoke in parables. And while people may have been confused at first, Jesus, he, he used illustrations that tended to like stick, stick to the mind and, and stick to the heart of his hearers. And the more they dwelled on those illustrations, the more the spirit revealed to them. So let's not just take this parable at face value or believe that it has only one possible meaning for us when there are a myriad of truths nestled just below the surface. As I spent time in prayer and reflection on this particular parable, the first thing that came to mind was this. The kingdom of God starts small but grows large. The mustard seed is one of the smallest seeds, yet it grows into a large tree. This illustrates how the kingdom of God started from humble beginnings, but expands and expands significantly. Think about it. The teachings of Jesus, they came onto the scene in small, poor, quiet communities. Yet today, these same teachings have infiltrated almost every country, city, village, and town across the world. Jesus lived at a time before cell phones, before the internet, before television, before radio, before the printing press. It was a time when the teachings of one individual could have easily gotten lost in history. Yet here we are. Here we are. The early Christian John Chrysostom put it like this. The gospel preached by the apostles is indeed the smallest of seeds in the estimation of the world. But it contains within itself such an energy and diffuses around it so great an influence that when it grows up, it becomes greater than any other doctrine and overspreads the whole world. That is the gospel. You see, even the smallest acts of faith and obedience 
can have a tremendous impact over time. Dear friends, do not despise small beginnings in your spiritual lives and ministries, especially when the Spirit of God is in the details. Now, you may recall another one of Jesus' teachings, that the, the mustard seed in that story also represents faith, faith. In Matthew 17, 20, Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Jesus wants us to know that even a small amount of genuine faith can lead to great results, big results. As I've mentioned in many past sermons, Scripture tells us that God has given each one of us, every single one of us, a measure of faith. We've all been given a measure of faith. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to plead for it. You've simply got to believe it and act upon it. Believe it and act upon it. But maybe your faith is too tiny. Maybe you feel it's too small or it's not as big as others that you view as mighty pillars of truth. Don't believe that lie. Don't believe that lie. Accept the truth as Jesus taught it and know that your seemingly small faith when placed in God can move mountains and achieve mighty things. And sometimes... Our Christian walk simply needs a shift in perspective, taking our attention, our focus off of ourselves and turning it to God. As Max Lucado said, faith is not the belief that God will do what you want, it is the belief that God will do what is right. (laughs) The late Pastor Tim Keller took a similar perspective when he wrote, It is not the strength of your faith, but the object of your faith that actually saves you. Let the object of your faith be Jesus. Jesus alone. Not your own strength, not your own abilities, not your own talents. Place your faith in Christ and him alone. Blessings will abound. I promise you that. Something else from this parable of the mustard seed that I don't often hear talked about is in connection with with the, the end of the parable as that little seed grows into a mighty tree where creatures then come to live and to thrive. I believe Jesus wants us to know about the inclusivity and shelter of the kingdom. The large tree in the parable shelters which can symbolize people, all nations, finding refuge and belonging in the kingdom of God. It it highlights the inclusive nature of God's kingdom where there is room for everyone, everyone. Paul tells us that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, free nor slave, male nor female. Lines of distinction. And barriers of separation have been knocked down, and now we are all one in Christ. And so, if we claim to be followers of Christ and obedient to his teachings, then our Edmund Church needs to be a house of refuge and a welcome place for all. Jesus' parable, it also offers hope and encouragement as we face the difficult realities of living in this fallen world, as it reminds us that we don't have all the answers. It teaches us patience and trust in God's timing. God's timing. The growth of the mustard seed into a tree 
it took time. It didn't happen overnight. And it symbolized that the advancement of God's kingdom is a process that requires patience and trust in God's timing. I think we all would, would love to just be able to wake up tomorrow and the gospel will have gone forth and everybody will have heard it. But that hasn't happened yet. And I don't think it's going to happen like that. Dear friends, I want to urge you to remain patient and faithful, trusting that God is at work even when things seem to be moving slowly or even imperceptibly. Have faith that God is at work. It's good to remember that when we work, and we should, who it is who is actually bringing forth the growth. Paul knew this. In 1 Corinthians 3, 6, he said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. But God gave the growth. There are good things that we should be partaking in as followers of Christ. Yet we don't take the credit because we know that the Spirit is actually the one that is knitting everything together and, and keeping everything alive Amen. and in motion. And I think it also takes the pressure off. It takes the pressure off of our shoulders. God has not called any of us to do it all. I don't know if you need to hear that. God has not called you to save the world all on your own. But instead, he's called us to trust and to listen and to move forward in faith when he leads, where he leads. And speaking of God's workings, the mustard seed parable teaches us something else concerning how it all happens, how it all goes down. It doesn't always make sense to our finite minds because it's the unexpected nature of God's work. The unexpected nature. The mustard seed growing into a tree is unexpected. You, you wouldn't expect that. Just as the ways that God works can be surprising and beyond human expectation. When we know God and we trust his plan, it leads to an openness concerning the unexpected ways God might be working in and through our lives. We shouldn't limit God by our own expectations. We can't even comprehend the amazing ways God can bring about all of his plans. We can't comprehend it. We're, we're told this in Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. Another early church father, Cyril of Alexandria, wrote, though the gospel teaching is simple and unadorned, when it is sown in the hearts of men, it makes us illustrious and the possessors of the highest dignity and enriches us with vast blessings. The gospel is powerful. And when that little seed is planted deep within the human heart, it gives birth to a powerful transformation that can only be attributed to divine power. If you've experienced this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've probably tried many times in your life to make changes, to build new habits, to lose bad habits, to stick with this, to let go of that. And you've probably failed a lot too. I know I have. But there's a, a type of change, a type of transformation that takes place in the life of a Christian who is committed and connected to God, who knows that they are in Christ, that can only be attributed to God. It's powerful. 
and it's a witness, and it's a testimony. If you, if you read that last book of the Bible, Revelation, you'll, you'll find this, this verse nestled in it that talks about the enemy that we have. We have this enemy, this enemy of our souls, but it says that we overcome him, and it's the power of the blood and also the word of our testimony, the way that God is working in your life, the ways that you see God working in your life. Share those stories. Give those testimonies because you don't know how it's going to be like a a healing balm to somebody. Maybe a first time they're hearing some certain truth. Share your story. Give your testimony. The devil is overcome by those things. You're uplifting Christ. The mustard seed illustration, it also shows the kingdom's influence. The parable, it it shows how the kingdom of God starts small, but it grows in influence and encompasses much. The church, and we are the church, not talking about a building here, we are the church. The church is to be active in spreading the gospel, sharing the good news. And we can be assured that our efforts, no matter how small, contribute to the larger growth of the kingdom of God. You never know how something as small as a smile, a hug, or just five minutes listening as somebody shares the burdens on their heart can be used by God to influence the growth of the gospel seed in someone else's life. When we are partnered with God, let us never downplay the mighty ripple effects for good that are are seemingly small acts or words or presence can bring. We are called by Christ to be salt and light in this world. It is, I believe, an invitation, a blessed invitation. Jesus' parable also teaches us the truth about humility and greatness in the kingdom. The parable of the mustard seed contrasts the small beginning with the large end. Small beginning, large end, emphasizing that in God's kingdom, true greatness often starts with humility. It's about servant leadership. There is Tremendous value in godly humility and servanthood. The fact of the matter is this. Greatness in God's kingdom often comes through humble beginnings and faithful service, not by stepping on others and pushing them down. All right, we've, we've reached the last point that I want to cover today. And this this final point is immensely important, especially considering the current time that we are in right now in America, as Christians in America. We need to always remember that Jesus is on the throne. Jesus is on the throne. And and I know, and just follow with me, don't cringe yet. (laughs) I know that it's presidential election season in the United States right now, right? I I think think we all are aware of that. And it's a time that is filled with excitement and passion, anxiety, frustration, fears for the future. And I'm not going to sit up here and say that it's best to, to not even think about it or don't be involved. It's important to be informed but we must not lose sight of the truth. Regardless of who is in the White House, Jesus is on the throne. Jesus is on the throne. Let's put it in perspective. When Paul was writing his letter to the church in Ephesus, he was making bold statements about how Jesus was in charge of running the universe and there was no power in this world that was exempt from his rule. And at that time, Christianity was merely a blip on the radar of the world. 
It was a tiny little sect in a forgotten corner of the mighty Roman Empire. And Paul was even writing that letter from a prison cell. (laughs) So, So just some context there when he was saying those things. Rome ruled the Western world and was described as the most extensive political and social culture and structure in all of Western society. Israel was a tiny, conquered, subjugated, fragmented, oppressed, and impoverished country. And when the empire executed the man that some thought and believed to be the Messiah, it seemed like the story of Rome was going to be the story throughout the world for a very long time. Yet where is that Roman empire today? Where is the Roman empire now? It actually fell within just a couple hundred years of of writing Ephesians. It was Christianity, the kingdom of God, that kept growing for the next 2,000 plus years, not Rome. The teachings of Christ have gained vast influence and reached into almost every little pocket of the globe. Jesus is on the throne. Jesus is on the throne. Every single human heart that is beating in this world is beating because Jesus is sustaining it. Every single breath that any man, woman, or child will take in this moment or in every moment to come are actually gifts given because Jesus Christ is ruling over everything. Think of all the millions of marvelous things that are happening right now in nature. The whales are still swimming and they're diving down deep. Mountain goats are still doing their thing. What what do mountain goats do? (laughs) Birds are, what was that? Climbing. (laughs) Birds are still migrating. They're flying through the air. The entire animal kingdom is still moving and breathing and flourishing because Jesus Christ is on the throne and sustaining all things according to his mighty word, according to Hebrews 1.3. As the election season ramps up, as difficulties arise in your life, and as fears for the future rear their ugly head, cling to the fact that Jesus is still on the throne. It will keep you centered on the truth and steady the worries of your heart and mind. Speaking of being centered on the truth, Do you realize that much of scripture is is meant to be read devotionally and meditatively? As As you face difficult circumstances in your life, lean on the truths of scripture. As an example, take Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In other words, Jesus is still involved in your life in the world, leading, guiding, providing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. God restores your weary heart. He gives you resilience. When you follow him, he guides you along the right paths for his namesake. In other words, don't get baited into all the social drama and all the rage bait that the world is offering to you. Let God lead you each and every day. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Yes, we may be in a dark time, but God is still protecting us and comforting us. You aren't navigating this alone. You aren't navigating this alone. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. God has a feast of goodness for you. 
even in rough times. Don't lose sight of him. Don't let anything else in this world grow bigger than the truth that Jesus is still on the throne. He fills your famished cravings. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Which means that our reality as sons and daughters of the king are not determined by pandemics or politics or anything else in this world. We live in God and he lives in us. His goodness is with us today and our future is absolutely wonderful. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. Dear friends, can, can you feel how trusting scripture and speaking these truths over your life will start to develop a, a mental resilience in you as you face whatever the world or the enemy of your souls is trying to throw at you? Plant that seed of truth that Jesus is still on the throne deep within your heart because that seed, it might seem small, but it won't stay that way, which is hopefully the, the biggest thing that we're learning today in this parable. Jesus put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. The kingdom of God's small beginnings and tremendous growth, the power of even small faith, the inclusivity of the kingdom, the need for patience, the unexpected ways that God works and the humble path to greatness. I wanna encourage y'all to trust in God's process. Be active in your faith and welcome all into the kingdom. Amen and amen. As we close, I'd like to offer you a practical way to apply something from today's message. So pull out your phones and take a picture of this week's secret place practice. As a follower of Christ, you've stepped into the living and active kingdom of God. In the upcoming week, take some time to reflect upon the growth this kingdom has brought into your own life. And as you thank God for how far you've come, place any future worries, fears, or concerns in his mighty hands, knowing that he isn't finished yet. The accompanying scripture text is Philippians 1, 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your kingdom. We thank you for your invitation into the kingdom. And Lord, as we've stepped into your kingdom that is spreading out more and more in this world, you've also invited us to be partakers of the kingdom and presenters of the kingdom. Lord, as we go out into the world, experiencing the peace that surpasses all understanding, knowing the truth that you are on the throne, no matter what happens in this world, may we also realize that we are ambassadors for your kingdom, that we are ambassadors for this ministry of reconciliation where you are trying to call the entire world back home. Give us opportunities to share your love and your grace. Give us opportunities to plant good seeds and give us opportunities to trust fully in you, placing our faith and our trust in your spirit as we talk and walk and move in this world and allow your light to shine through us. We pray this all in Jesus' name and we pray this in faith, amen.